bracing for impact. That's yeah, how I feel right yeah. now. <sighs> What's up, Merce Nation? Javier Mercedes here for yet another Passion in Progress podcast. And who do we have today with me? It is Kelly Cornett of A Cork in the Road here in Atlanta, Georgia. What? I'm not in Austin? Yeah, that's right. Your boy's in Atlanta right now. Um, this is such an awesome podcast that we have for you today. I cannot wait. It's going to be amazing because the person in front of me, there's like, there's some people that you meet during your lifetime that they're like so passionate about something that they're destined for great things. And I feel like the person in front of me is like, it's definitely one of those people. And I hope that you guys, uh, that you guys learn from, uh, as we go through this podcast, like how much this person knows about pairing wine with food and other things of that nature. So uh, let's go ahead and get with it. And just to start off, I give me like a 45 second spiel of the service that you provide and what you do at A Cork in the Road. <laughs> you are so kind. Um, first of all, I'm in shock that I'm with you because, again, someone that's passionate, I'm sitting right in front of them as well. A skill that I know nothing about. Give me wine, I'll talk all day. Give me mechanical equipment, good luck. Um, mm -hmm. Not going to happen. Yeah, so I, I'm a I'm a wine nerd. That's At the end of the day, that's what it is. But um, I used to manage a winery, and I've done everything from sorting grapes in the cellar to talking about vine control, to doing fancy pairing dinners in Washington, D.C. and on mm -hmm. the road with distributors. Like, the wine world goes from the earth and the soil to your restaurant, your fancy glassware in, um, at the end of the day of a dinner. So I was pulled in to the wine world way back then, and since then, I learned while I was there that there was this huge interest from people that wanted to learn not only like what they were tasting, but why they liked something or like why they didn't. Mm -hmm. And so when I was talking to people that would come through our tasting events or when I'd go on the road shows and go to restaurants, people were like, I want to be able to ask better for wines that I want to drink. Yeah. And I don't always know the questions to ask or, or who to go to. So as I was going through the industry, you know, I was like, okay, there might be a need for people to learn, you know, how to ask for things they want and what they're tasting and give them the tools and the skills. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I think I can be that bridge between the industry knowledge and the customer base and kind of the consumers out there. Yeah. Because I'm not, I kind of float that midline. I kind of go between, sometimes I'm an industry girl, yeah. sometimes I'm an average wine shopper. Yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> so now my events and my tasting classes are meant to give people the skills and the tools to be just better wine consumers for themselves and for their own personal tastes. Awesome. So uh, just for the viewers, explain the concept of wine versus beer. So wine versus beer grew out of the tasting classes and the group events I was doing just for wine. Mm -hmm. When I was in the wine classes, people would say, you know, oh, I wonder if this will help me, you know, pick out other things like coffee, tea. I wonder if my tastes are similar with chocolate or they were mm -hmm. asking these types of questions. And so... I also knew that I had really talented friends in Atlanta that were really knowledgeable about beer, about food, and kind of culinary things. Mm -hmm. So I thought I'd do an event that not only let the guests kind of explore the taste themselves, but give a chance to highlight other my, my beverage enthusiasts like Kristen or our friend that works at um, Three Taverns, brewery here, so, you know, people in the industry that have a similar knowledge to wine, because we all speak the same language. We're all beverage yeah. nerds. That's what yeah. it is. Yeah. So we wanted to have an event that, you know, I thought, hey, I can set these events up with different people to challenge me with their beer knowledge mm -hmm. and also showcase people that are really good at flavors and dishes and then let people explore the flavor combinations throughout the event. So that's where Wine vs. Beer came from. And since then, I have asked restaurants to participate because it shows off a chef's new menu. A distributor has been interested because they can showcase their portfolios of wine and beer, and I help mm -hmm. them kind of do showdowns with, with different restaurants. So I welcome new challengers because for me, it's showcasing new knowledge, new food, new flavors. The only person who's 100% uh, undefeated is my husband, and he's done pairings with wine and beer, and he'll tell you that right away. Mm -hmm. He'll be the one to tell you, I'm undefeated. <laughs> uh, Kelly doesn't know that I'm about to do this, but I, I think in order to prove to you guys like what she knows about uh, um, wine pairing, uh, obviously, if you watch my YouTube channel, you know that I cook a lot of food. <laughs> So, uh, so I cook a lot of, um, I've been cooking my way through Gordon Ramsay's um, cookbook. So I actually have, 
I've written out the ingredients and everything from the stuff that I've cooked, and I would just I, – I believe the best way to showcase people your skill set is to – <laughs> to, oh my gosh! To to, uh, to 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 <laughs> to tell them what wine you would pair with this dish, and then um, why you why you would do it and go through because like when I was talking to you about this kind of stuff, the thing that interests me the most was like, man, I didn't even think about certain aspects of like acidity and all this other stuff. Right. So without further ado, ah! maybe I could have like some catch song or like it's pop quiz with Javi. <laughs> <laughs> all right, first on the menu. I love it. Pork chops with peppers. So this is, um, it's cooked with, it's just like a really nice pork chop, um, salt and pepper, garlic cloves, and there's butter um, that you're putting over the pork chop like a steak. And uh, with that butter is, you put the thyme in there. So it's like butter and thyme together. Mm -hmm. uh, it comes with the peppers that are a little bit sweeter. So the they're cooked with red onions and they're the uh, peppers are sautéed and um, it's like a mixture of red onion and peppers and there's this red wine vinaigrette that makes it sweeter. Um, that's the gist of the dish. Can you tell me what you would pair with that? Wow! First of all, that sounds delicious. It, um, trust me, it is. And that's the hard part of my job is I talk about wine and food, but sometimes we don't always have it in front of us. Yeah. So now I'm drooling about that. This is amazing. So. The cool part for me when I'm thinking about this dish, I always go to, I think about the sauces and the, the extra spices. So when someone says, I'm having chicken, that's usually not enough for me to come up with a pairing because yeah, it's sure. really, you know, the the dressings and the, the kind of the fine details is actually where I kind of hone in on what wine to do. Yeah. So when I, when I was when I was writing this, I was like, oh, wait, I can't just give her those because when I was in her, uh, when we, if you haven't seen it, you should check out the episodes of her wine versus beer on my YouTube channel, Javier Mercedes. OK, moving on. Um, w when we did that, when talking to you, I realized that you guys don't get to taste the dishes before pairing it. That's so crazy to me that like you don't think about that, but somebody that's pairing this dish for this event, they don't get to taste it beforehand. But you can know what the the palate stuff is from the ingredients, the specific ones that are in there. But continue. Yes, it's very important that that is known. We never get to try the dishes, even when I go to restaurants and do these. Um, usually I don't get the, the dish in advance. I get a very detailed menu from the chef, mm -hmm. try to ask questions where I'm not sure, you know, is that a butter sauce or is it a cream sauce? Like that's very important to me. So I'll get a chance to ask those, but I never get to taste. I'm really banking in when you, when you taste a lot of wine, you describe wine with flavors that are in your food or in the environment. So you're, you're often looking for floral things, for spices, for herbs, for grasses. Mm -hmm. The only way I know about that is from my personal experience with foods and mm -hmm. in the environment, wet stones. I've smelled wet stones. I know what that <laughs> tastes like, you know, and then that's you try to imagine what that tastes like. Um, but that's how it is. So when I get a description at that all of those sensory things are coming to my, my past experiences with those smells and flavors. Mm -hmm. So pork, you know, is a wonderful, is a wonderful protein because you can dress it up with lots of different things. So when you talk about the red wine sauce that's going on and kind mm -hmm. of the peppers, Normally, I would say with a pork and with the thyme, with anything kind of Thanksgiving spices, I say, yep. I like to have Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir is something that's a very smooth, nice, balanced acid red. Um, you can definitely go white, but I like to go red when I can because it highlights a lot of the kind of herbaceous things and a little bit more differently in kind of the spice world. So I would say like an like a, a little bit more fruit forward because we're going off of kind of the, the red wine. A fruit forward Pinot Noir would be really nice, smooth, because you have kind of that, like, it's going to be a play of a lot of different spices in the mm -hmm. sauce. But, yeah, a nice smooth Pinot Noir. If you could, I actually would feel like a something like um, if you're going to be fancy, mm -hmm. go for a port because a port actually has a little bit of off-dry kind of, natural sweetness in there and also is usually fortified with like a brandy so you might have a little bit of that kind of spice from the fortification with the fruit forward kind of candied fruit that yep. might be really nice with that dish that's crazy I actually just tried port for the first time um I think like a year ago and I didn't know what it was but the guy that was the guy was super into port and I was just like it just reminds me of a ship port I don't know what you're talking about <laughs> you're like, and then wait, I was like it? oh it, it's kind of, to me it reminds me of like a mold wine something something that's like 
when you when you mull spices with with a wine, it, it's like a it's like a blend of something. That's right. I'm I'm trying to sound like I know what I'm talking you about when it, when it comes know. to wine. You know, <laughs> port to me also. I feel like whenever I talk about port or sherry, I'm always like, you need a fireplace and it needs to be winter. Like you need to be sitting somewhere cozy yeah, with sure. a fireplace for and sure. maybe a cigar. Like that's what I feel. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> All right. Dish number two. Let's get to it. All right. So moving on. Roasted cod with walnut, lemon, and parmesan. Um, this is cooked. It's it's roasted in the oven. It's cooked with butter, walnut pieces. Uh, think of um, the cod that what's going onto the cod is basically all of this stuff is the breading that's going on there. So it's the breading is uh, walnut pieces, fresh bread comes, in that is uh, grated zest of lemon, and then uh, after the after it comes out of the oven, you put some Parmesan cheese on it, salt and pepper. Mm-hmm. And then what also goes on to it is this parsley and caper sauce. And it's, uh, it's, mi- it's mixed with the uh, – it's a mixture of fish stock is the biggest liquid that's in there. And then capers, uh, small bunches of parsley, and then uh, it turns into a white um, sauce that you have to constantly stir to not have it clump up with creme fraiche. Uh, so when you you put it you put that sauce on top of the roasted cod, what would you pair with this? Oh, that sounds so cool. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so my head is spinning with okay that we're in the white world. We're definitely in a white wine situation here. The minute you said creme fraiche, whenever I have kind of creamy, especially lemon, lemon is actually pretty difficult to not find a wine that has an acid that clashes with the citrus of um, citric acid in lemon and just lime in general, like citrus Mm -hmm. flavors. So I'm definitely going white and I'm definitely going very crisp. I want a high acid white. But the thing is, you were talking about walnuts and Mm -hmm. kind of Parmesan, which is like a nutty flavor. Mm -hmm. So I'm going in. I would like to highlight that. So when I find out in a dish that there's like a flavor like that, I'm like, what wine would be able to highlight that? And a lot of times, a um, an oak aged, it could be a half stainless steel, half oak aged, like a Viognier or a Chardonnay that has a little bit more weight to the body. Mm-hmm. So you have a little bit of kind of a, a heavier mouth feel, but it has kind of a nutty undertone. Sometimes they have kind of um, a pecan like kind of feel. I've had some like that, or. Um, Yeah, just like a a roasted nut tone would be really cool if it was an oak-aged, barrel-aged Chardonnay from kind of New World. I'm thinking like a heavier. Or a Viognier from uh, like Loire Valley that maybe has some touch of oak to it. So it brings out those kind of nuttier tones to it. Awesome. But high acid would be important too. You got to have the high acid when you're pairing with acid. Awesome. Awesome. I I love the term acidic acid because it's just like a it's it's you're saying acid with acid. Uh, but, yes. <laughs> but, but, uh, somebody somebody actually pointed that out to me like that's. Not oh a, no, a, a citric acid. Yeah. No, no, yeah. you you said it correctly. I what I'm what I'm talking about is like oh it's like do you put some acidic acid on there and it's like that's not a term. That's but, not but, a term. But the way that you said it was correct. I'm just saying whenever when I. When I would describe something, I was like, oh, yeah, you put some acidic acid on that, and it's not that's not a thing. <laughs> in cooking, um, that probably comes y- up. <laughs> yeah. If, if you hang out with me enough, I, you find out that I just make up words, and then if you say it with enough confidence, it becomes true. So wow. moving on, <laughs> dish number three with Javi and Kelly. <laughs> a cork in the road, hashtag. Um, spicy black beans and feta cheese and avocado. I actually just made this yesterday, and it, it tastes like the bomb.com. Side note, if you go to the bomb.com, it goes to the chive. Anyhow, uh, so with this one, it's it's a bean dip. Um, but the way that it's made uh, is, I, I love it because it, it tastes really good. Um, it's more than just the beans. So small onion, it's charred in there. And then that, so you sweat the onion until it has a char on it. Then you put in the garlic right before you start to get a burnt on the onion. Um, and then that garlic also starts to get the char on it then you put in the black beans those black beans sit in there and you let it just sit in there and let the black beans they're from a can so they're already kind of like soft but you let them get soft and just soak up that awesome goodness and while they're soaking there's cumin there's coriander um there's uh cinnamon in there that all just kind of marinate together uh, sorry, there is no coriander, but it's cumin and cinnamon, the, the staples of a nice uh, Mexican dish. But you let that sit in there, then you you 
take it out, you mash it up, and you get that bean texture. It could be, uh, you could use a fork and get like a nice rustic texture, or you could throw it in a blender and get a nice smooth um, texture with it. Moving on, you serve it on a fried tortilla or tostada. So you take some vegetable oil and you fry the, hot tip, by the way, fry your tortillas. It just like, it takes your, if, if you were making a breakfast, it just takes your brunch game to another level. Uh, so take your tortilla, you fry it, and then it turns into this almost chip thing, but it's a nice soft texture. Uh, then that's served with feta cheese, uh, avocado, sliced avocado on there, and then you squeeze a lime on top. Um, what would you pair for dish number three, the spicy black beans? <laughs> <laughs> Kelly. Try to think of a rhyme that yeah, rhymes yeah, with yeah. Um, this wine. But not in... <laughs> <laughs> You got the game. Okay. I got you. Let's do it. Um, this is this might be the easiest thing you've thrown at me, Javi. Awesome. This is my go-to pairing, and it, it's a weird one, but I never stray away from serving a sparkling brut rosé with Mexican food. It is my favorite thing to do. So it can be it can be a still rosé too, but dry, brut. Um, really, really fun combination. And that was actually one of the most popular pairings I've ever had in any of our wine versus beer dinners. Um, uh, one of our contestants who was on this past episode, mm-hmm. David Rowe, he made um, enchiladas. And they were chicken enchiladas. They were very spicy. They had like a, ver- uh, a, ver- uh, a salsa, salsa verde, verde sauce. Yep. And I just threw in this Austrian, it's called the Meinklang um, Frizzante. It's a rosé. It sounds like a powerful wine. It has a the cow. The Klang. It has a cow on the front. It's amazing. <laughs> um, so you know it's good. It's so good. It's so good. <laughs> So, yeah, that was a go-to pairing. It's a sparkling. It's a little bit full flavor. Like, it's one of those kind of, um, I would say, heavier colored pink rosés. Not your light uh, southern France ones, Mm -hmm. but a little bit more heavy. So, it has a lot of, like, strawberry fruit tones, but this really cool, like, tight bubble fizz to it. Oh, my gosh. With the avocado, with the spice, it just cut right through the spice, and it balanced out the dish to just give it this, like, bubbly kind of fizz mm-hmm. thing so when i'm thinking of your the beans and the 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 dip part of that yeah mm-hmm. anything with mexican flavors i start with a bubbly rosé and then if not bubbly then i definitely even think that just a still rosé is still nice mm-hmm. because it gives it this floral strawberry tone very opposite than trying to match the the citric acid and the citrus flavors you don't want to match those yeah you want to go with um something a little bit different when it comes to the to the mexican flavors Rosés are so hot right now. So so hot right now. <laughs> yeah, uh, they're they're hot, Lana. Um, th- talking to other wine connoisseurs, it seems like the it's like the it's the hipster thing to do right now. Rosés. That's me trying to know what I'm talking it's about. It's true, but with, you you know rose. hashtag rosé all day. You know it. I mean, yes, my rosé. It's becoming such a thing. There is even a company now. I think she started on Instagram, but she was yes way rosé, and like now yes it's way like rose. yeah, now it's like um in rosé all day, and they all have T-shirts now, and it's like a brand, and they like sell products with it on there, and I was like, so it's become a thing. It's definitely mm-hmm. a cultural shift. Um, but even. Even so, in the restaurant world, I I even see a lot more rosés by the glass now. And you never used to see that because I think people assume pink wine sweet. Um, And in America, that's kind of what it was. We weren't getting kind of the French style, the old world style rosés. We were getting white Zinfandel. Like back, you know, 20 years ago, that's what rosé pink wine was. Mm -hmm. It was sweeter. And so, you know, changing the mindset of these wines can be super cool with food because usually they are higher acid. When you have a rosé... There's a couple ways to make the rosé, but the the cool part is a lot of them are made from red grapes and you start with the process of like that you're going to make red wine, mm-hmm. but you stop the fermentation process with the skins, the seeds, and you drain off the juice really early. I mean, I'm talking like within 4 to 6 hours. Is it is the term for that the runoff? Is the, that yeah, the yeah. Sa- uh, sangri or the sa- uh, I have no idea. Yes, there's a bleeding off. It's like the okay. the French okay. word for bleeding off the 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 liquid. And then you have this kind of pink colored juice, but it's from originally the red grapes, the skins. So if you have a really dark red grape, you're starting with a lot more potent color, a lot more potent flavor. So if you start with like a, um, a Cabernet Franc grape as a really thicker skin, you're going to get a heavier flavored rosé even that mm-hmm. it starts the... 
the fermentation process, you're stopping it on a really bold grape. You're bleeding off just a little bit of juice from it that's been in contact with the skins. You're going to still get some cool flavors. So that's for me. When you go to the store, you look at the rosé aisle, it's like shades of rosé. You can like taste <laughs> the rainbow of rosé. Yeah, it's so cool because you can see the through those kinds of glasses too with the way that the rosé looks. Oh, it's yeah. like a water, but it's like not. It's not. And you can definitely be nerdy. If you want to ask, a, a wine shop will be very happy to hear this. If you're like, I'm looking for a rosé with skin t- contact co- time of, like, oh, if you're looking, I'm looking for a rosé with skin contact of four to six hours. They'll look kidding? at you and they'll be really excited. They'll think you're crazy and then they'll be really excited to help you. <laughs> like, oh my God, I can't wait. You're the perfect customer. Yes. But those are the come, kind of come questions. Come here. Come with me. Yes. Or like knowing that, you know, if you have a rosé and you, you like kind of those more orange colored wines, you ask for ones that have very minimal skin contact because that means that it hasn't really sat on the grape or you're looking for rosés of Pinot Noir because Pinot Noir is a very thin skinned grape. It starts off already with very thin, you know, a lighter color. Mm-hmm. So then you know that that's the type of rosé you like, they ask for it. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. For sure. Rosé all day. With Mexican hooray. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. All right, dish number four. We're looking for more. It's raspberry cheesecake. So one of the things um, going to this wine versus beer event is it's five courses, right? It's it, like when I think of wine before this, I was a beer drinker and obviously I enjoy wine, but I didn't even think about like, oh, pairing wine with dessert. Dang. Um, okay. So I... On my YouTube channel, I made Gordon Ramsay's Raspberry Cheesecake. I mean, it's a cheesecake, so just to give you what's in the cheesecake besides the cheesecakeness is cream cheese, raspberries. Um, it's made with eggs, uh, plain flour. I mean, it's cheesecake. But the only th- other thing, too, is he there's no crust, so it's, it, it's just the cheesecake. And then also there's some finely grated uh, zest of, like, one whole lemon in there. So it gives it a little um, – when you bite into it, there's that hint of lemon in each bite mm. that complements the raspberry along with having an amazing cheesecake. So mm. what would you pair with that? Okay. There's a lot of different directions you can go with this. I do think that dessert wines don't get as much credit as they should. I think, I think, I think I'm a testament of that because I just didn't – I'm like, well, if you really like drinking wine and then you're like, oh, wait, I can have it with dessert too. It's like breakfast, lunch, dinner, and dessert. It is. It totally is. You can have wine at any meal. And literally, there are other um, there are other countries in the world that totally believe in that. Um, mm-hmm. So we should get on that train. Yeah. But yeah, I actually really enjoy... So dessert's hard um, mm-hmm. for wine because you'll typically hear the rule is you want to match sweetness with sweetness. Mm-hmm. It's not that it's not that you need to have it be, you know, more sweet than the dessert, but you definitely don't want to have something that's too earthy, too herbaceous, with a sugar-based course, um, it can be a big clash. Mm-hmm. So it's hard to find that balance because a lot of people I, I meet now, you know, prefer their desserts to be a little less sweet just in general. Mm-hmm. So then you're trying to find wines that have kind of that mid-level sweetness, maybe like a 7% residual sugar, 7 to 10%. So they're not like dessert wines, like ice style wines are like 16%, just for example, yeah. like for residual sugar that's left. And, you know, you can have like a a it's, nice. I, I think it's crazy that you think of the dessert wine. So looking at it in terms of um, alcohol content, but it's not alcohol content. It's like how much sugar yep. is it bringing to the table? So it doesn't overcompensate or not compensate. It just doesn't overflow you with sugar. Right. That's that's crazy. But continue. No, it's true. You can't. You don't want to knock people out with sugar. Ah, uh, yeah. you can't do that. So it's finding that nice balance. And if you think about it, sometimes a lot of desserts play off this concept already on the dish because they like to do like sweet and salty. Mm-hmm. Think about that. Like a lot of people like caramel salt, you know, or caramel, caramel sea salt type desserts. Yeah. It's playing off that if you did sweet and sweet, it might be too much. A lot of people might not want, you know, a caramel wrapped in chocolate, which sounds amazing. But if you don't really want super sweet, then you're going to go salty with the caramel instead of mm-hmm. other sweet. So when I play with desserts, you know, my typical thing, I love to do like really, if I'm going to do like an ice style wine, which is really my favorite type of dessert wine because it's a long process. They're very, I respect people that make them because you literally wait till the grape freezes on the vine. So you make these in like, oh, cool. up, you know, upper upstate New York and the Finger Lakes are doing that. In Canada, they do a lot of ice style wines where their grapes do naturally freeze on the vine. And then you go pick the frozen grapes and you press them. Mm-hmm. And so the sugar that comes out, imagine that. I mean, it's very concentrated. It's almost like a syrup that drips through yeah, and sure. it takes forever to press that grape. 
So you get like these golden honey type wines that are just like super, super rich. A lot of times they have a very smooth, full bodied taste, but they're still sweet. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to do that, I like to do something completely not sweet. I'm doing like a cheese plate or like a cheese, like a salty cheese plate with Mm -hmm. an ice style wine is one of my favorite desserts. You know, it's perfect. Um, So for your cheesecake, I don't want to go super, super sweet. I don't think I would serve a a lot of sugar in there. A lot of sugar. Yeah. yeah. So I'm thinking with cheesecake, I'm not going to do something that's really, really high sugar, typical dessert wine, but I'd want something a little bit off dry. So this I'm going to go in my head. I've, I've had some, we actually used to serve this at the winery I used to work at. It was a, um, an off dry chamberson grape, but it could be, it could be any type of kind of table red wine. Um, mm-hmm. a lot of grapes for that are like Grenache or even, um, even like a Merlot, but it, it could be something that's more of a, an Sangiovese, something that's kind of like a, a table wine for the dinner. But if, if it's done in an off dry style. So for example, the Chamberson that we had was like about three to 5% residual sugar, had yeah. a nice sweetness to it. Mm-hmm. You could even chill it. And I would definitely chill this for the dessert pairing. Mm-hmm. So a nice chilled off dry red that has a very fruit, like cherry, strawberry flavor at the forefront of the palate but serve it a little bit chilled to go with the dessert because I think that would be like almost like drizzling an extra sauce on top of the cheesecake with this kind of off dry wine pairing. God, it's it's like there's so many other things you could dive into just in pairing alone of talking about palate and all like, so you're talking about chilling and all that stuff. And I, for me, I, I'm not even thinking about, Oh, this is served cold. You don't, you're not going to, like, here's a dry red wine. Like, it's completely, it, it's, it, it touches all spectrums of how you have a dish. And uh, I, I, I'm curious to see if it, it was even, like, the music that's playing in the background would, would accentuate or devalue the kind of wine that you're having with a, a raspberry cheesecake and, and, like, the atmosphere that you're in. It's crazy. Can I do a shout-out to a really cool person who sure. has that exact concept? Sure. Um, so... Chef Sean Brock. He Mm -hmm. was on Food Network. He's awesome. Doing some really cool things in the South. And I went to his kind of small project called McCrady's. It's like a 18 topper restaurant um, in Charleston, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And it's where he just like unleashes all of his culinary like creativity and it's like a, a 15 course meal throughout the Jesus night Christ. it's amazing and you're probably full by the end of that yeah. <laughs> i was full and very <laughs> drunk because <laughs> <laughs> because each of the courses came with a wine or a no. beer pairing <laughs> yes but here's what Damn. i'll tell you you you're onto something because he actually makes sure that the music soundtrack throughout every dinner serving is strategically played at the different courses so what he's playing on so you know he might have like smashing pumpkins is supposed to come (laughs) on and this is like legit he he'll have that come on at a certain course that he feels that that song is perfect with the wine you're getting the food you're. i mean it was part of the experience that i've never seen very intentionally done but it really elevated the whole experience because you were like i'm already smelling and tasting a bunch of stuff and then you're like but listen to what he's playing. Oh my gosh. So he he definitely focused on combining all of that into a really intimate like three hour meal. But it was mm-hmm. the experience from the sound, the taste, the smells. Yeah. Super shout out to that concept because that is a really big part of just what you're tasting at that time, what your experience is. Yeah, that's it's crazy because uh, uh, watching things like Chef's Table and other culinary uh, documentaries like Psalm or other things like that, what you're talking about in terms of experience is once you reach that certain level of being a culinary like expert, there's so much more than just the food that's there. It's like, um, what's, is it Alina in Chicago? That, Alinea, that, yeah. Alinea, yeah. like that place where, uh, I mean, I haven't been there, but just seeing the, the stuff that comes out of there with that whole sugar balloon and all that stuff, it's like, you're you're eating you're eating the air that's in the balloon and then whatever that membrane thing is uh if you haven't seen just like look up that clip it's it's really cool uh but not only that it's like the whole atmosphere and the the chefs while they're talking about their dishes they talk about the whole experience i think there was like one episode where this guy just the it's a four-star restaurant in the middle of nowhere and they have they just have this cellar and the the way that they cook the food out of that cellar is like the most bestest thing but you come there for that food mm. I, I don't know that's a whole nother discussion for a whole nother time but i it, it just brings up how much more your experience uh 
in eating something is more than just the food. Absolutely. It's the wine, too. It's the wine, too. <laughs> and it's definitely the people you're with. That also matters yeah. very much. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so I could I could do some rapid fire ones, but I think I think I just wanted to give people a sense of your expertise and your skill set and what you do. Uh, so I, I'm pretty sure you have an understanding of a cork in the roads uh, where she sits with pairing wines to different foods. Um, you should probably send her, send her some hashtag a cork in the road. Uh, just like take a picture of your own food and be like, hey, you know what? What would you pair with this? A cork in the road. Is that is that a good hashtag? Hashtag a cork. Yes. Oh, my God. Do you know that would be like, that's my favorite type of text to get. It's my favorite type of phone call. It's I often have friends that are like, I have this dinner. I have to bring this wine. This person likes this. I'm at this shop. What should I get? Yes, call me anytime. That's like that's the best. I love that. Send me emails. What are you doing? Where are, where are you gonna be? Um, where are you shopping? Like that to me. I'll give you some recommendations of of people that might welcome you into their retail shop that have a really cool selection. Um, when I travel, I travel for wine. And you were just mentioning some like culinary experiences. And I was recently in New York City, and I had the honor of going to Eleven Madison Park, which to me was like. In New York City, like that to me just is doing the whole culinary experience at this level that I didn't know I could even experience. Mm -hmm. um, and what was really cool is we had a chance to meet the the former Sam there. He now has a retail shop, and in in New York City called Verve Wine. Um, Dustin Wilson, he's in the Sam films. He's amazing, but he he has found that the retail space, different than the restaurant space, is where he gets to talk to customers more often and help them buy wines on a daily basis That's that crazy. they want to cook with their food. And so yeah. he has the restaurant background, but then when you talk to people, you people that when you go shopping for wine. If it's a retail shop that is just about wine and having that be a specialty thing on their shelves, that they have hand-selected everything on their shelves, they want you to come in there and have a specific reason what you're, you know, what you're looking for, yep. what you're wanting to buy. Yep. So that is the coolest part of that retail space. Yeah, for sure. And you get one-on-one -on -one interaction with the people that your end product well i guess in the when you're cooking food for people that's the most like here's this food i literally made it and then here's that but also you get to interact and they get to be a part of the experience it's not just here's here's this list of wines like here's a whole space let's go to town <clears throat> it's that's so cool it's so cool learn so much doing a show like this really cool interesting people like a cork in the road all right, let's move on to now that people have a sense for who you are, your background and everything else that you do with um, wine versus beer and everything else. Uh, I heard from a bird that uh, you spent some time in Argentina, correct? See. See? See? <laughs> See. The, um, were you studying there? I did, yeah. I studied abroad during college. I did a program in Buenos Aires. Uh, my question is getting to experience other cultures like that for an extended amount of time, does that affect your palate and what you do to approach wine pairings and things of that nature? You just sent me into dreamland of remembering Argentina. Let me come back. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, here I am already like thinking of, I just was like one moment I'm going on vacation. I'll be right back. Um, it absolutely was a time in my life where it shaped how I thought about wine mm -hmm. was just living in a culture you know, one of those countries where wine is just served at the meal. It's an automatic. It's part of it's it's the side dish. It's the accompaniment. It's what goes with that food. Wine was served in little juice, uh, juice sized cups at dinner at my <laughs> house at my host family. Um, it was like little like instead of a water or a milk cup, you're like, here, have your red wine with your dinner. Mm -hmm. um, it's part of every day. And it's about where it comes from. So when I was in Argentina, it was a cultural experience to learn about the wines that they grow there, especially with the importing and exporting the way that works. You know, they're not drinking Napa wines there. That's not what they get. So mm -hmm. when you're there, you're really drinking what is served more locally. And when I was in Argentina, I was really focusing on drinking things like Bonarda and Malbec, things that the Argentine culture drinks so often. So a lot of their food ends up being something that evolves or, you know, it could be vice versa. I don't know, chicken or the egg, the wine yep. and the food end up really complementing each other. 
So that's the experience you get there. And then um, I did go on a, a trip to Mendoza, to the region there. I was riding my bike around to all <laughs> the wineries, and um, which is a great experience. Very dangerous, but mm-hmm. um, super fun. And <laughs> It's like you're encouraging people, but not encouraging uh, people to do it. They do, have poli- safety. they do have police escorts at the end of the night to make sure all of the, the wine tasting tourists get back to their rental bike shops uh, mm-hmm. appropriately. So they do take care of you there. Um, um, but I I remember going to the vineyards there and, you know, you're standing in someone's kitchen of their farmhouse, of their plot of land, where that's the Malbec that they grow every year. That's like, that's their income. That's their, you know, their crop. That's their art. Mm-hmm. And just seeing it in person, that was kind of the first time where I spent an extended amount of time on a vineyard in, you know, wine country like that, where it's not commercialized in the same way that, Um, they're preparing to export all around the world. A lot of times there you're going to smaller places that a lot of that just stays in South America or in Argentina. That's so cool. It's like, it's like the, um, what's, uh, it's like the craft brewery, but you're doing it wine style down there. Wine style. Yeah, that's Mm -hmm. awesome. Uh, and not only that, but you get the whole agricultural, um, aspect of it, which is, it brings me to my next point. Um, you, was it West Virginia where you were, um, or Virginia? Virginia. Uh, Mm -hmm. Virginia where you were managing a winery, correct? Correct, yes. yes. Um, in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, about two hours west of D.C. Um, this was something that is that became a, um, a detour in life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> really, yeah, when um, I think back on it, it was a detour that really capitalized on passion that I, I knew I had, but I hadn't really explored. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, living in Virginia, um, I started off just working part-time in the tasting room. Virginia now is... People are like, what? Virginia makes wine? Yes, yes. I'm one of those guys. Yes, yes, they do. And (laughs) Hoppy, let me tell you, they are the fifth largest state production of wine in the United States. Wow. Yes, behind behind California, um, Washington, Oregon, and New York, you have Virginia. Um, So, quick quick question about mm -hmm. that: How much factored into why they're the fifth is? Does it have to do with climate and real estate? I think it has to do with the 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 production size of the winery, the okay. production capability okay. um, to do big time, you know, where you are at the shelf at your local grocery store. We're talking huge production type things. Yeah. A lot of the wineries in Virginia are still owned by, you know, a husband and wife couple or they're doing maybe five to six thousand cases a year, mm-hmm. which doesn't make it something that is easy to grow because then you have to get more equipment and you have to have storage space and it becomes mm-hmm. this bigger it's production. Yeah, it yeah, is. For, and for it sure. becomes that similar with the breweries in the same way. Like where are you going to have the warehouse and the production facilities to, you know, get all enough product out to your customers in that supply chain line? Um, so, yeah, I think that a lot of people like to keep it at their production size that they have the equipment to do. Yeah. And so growing it is when more of those places happen. And that's what happened in Virginia. Like in the early 2000s, like 2005 area like that, there were definitely wine wineries popping up. But it became something like, oh, I have the land. And they were learning the soil. So Virginia Tech has been really crucial there because a lot of the wineries will send soil samples. And they have a really good program there in viticulture. And so they'll be able to say, you know, hey, you know, we can't grow Cabernet Sauvignon like they can in, you know, Alexander Valley. But we can grow some amazing Cabernet Franc. So that's what we're going to plant. You know, it's learning what your land can give you. Why try to be something that you're not? Mm -hmm. Virginia has really found its niche in certain grapes that are becoming kind of their signature path, what they can offer to the customer. And they're getting known for that. Mm -hmm. So now there's like 250 wineries. It's a wine tasting destination. It's wonderful. And each place is very unique because you still kind of have that um, you know, ownership of what they're growing. And a lot of it still comes from Virginia. So they're not, you know, it's it's becoming a good place to go if you want to see on-site production, meet the people behind the wine. The winemakers often have a lot of experience from Europe. They're bringing in a lot of folks from France, um, a lot of people actually even from South Africa. So that's a, my winemaker, he was from South Africa. And they were learning, the more that that knowledge spreads among the group of winemakers in Virginia, you also have this increase in just like setting the bar higher of what you can do with the it's grapes. Cool, what competition brings to the table? Yes, they're learning from each other and competing with each other, mm-hmm. and it just drives the quality up and up. Um, so that's a really cool thing to see. But it's also a very supportive community. You know, when you think about competition or like 
when I do the wine versus beer challenges, mm -hmm. I have my competitor come in yeah, and, yeah. you know, try to beat them. But actually in the wine industry, there's a lot of support and a lot of camaraderie. Where I was was a little pocket in the Shendo Valley. And when someone comes to that area, they're probably not just going to go to one winery. They're looking to go to other places. Mm -hmm. So working together to become a, a destination for a certain yeah. type of wine and have that tourism hospitality piece to your business is really important. That means knowing your neighbors, knowing you know where to recommend people to go eat when they're in town or where to stay. Mm -hmm. It kind of pops up like that. So there's a lot of, you know, very much community support among the wine, the wine folks. <laughs> that's, that's, that's really cool to hear that your branding in and of itself is part of a bigger uh, picture. Like you're, 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 uh, I can't think of the term, but the sum of whatever equals the whole um, in when looking at something, working together to accomplish uh, driving more business to that area and having them all work together, is that's really cool to hear about. Because um, I think if you're just trying to work in any field, if you're just trying to do something by yourself, there's only so far that you can get. But once you start having other people that are like, no, I know how to do this, I know how to do that, it's just like things start compounding on each other. And it's so cool to hear that version of it in the wine Field. We also drank a lot together. That helps. <laughs> we also get yes. along. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We did a lot of like wine, wine member. It was the Shendo Valley Wine Growers Association meetings where everybody brought a bottle from their winery, and we all just you know shared tips. What kind of bugs are you dealing with right now? What's the what's the weather looking like? How are you dealing with frost mm -hmm. while drinking all of the wine? It brings people it's, together. It sounds like the best <laughs> way to have a business conversation. It brings people together. Yeah. Um, are you interested in becoming a psalm yourself? You know, I've definitely considered it. I think for me, not necessarily the SOM route. The most interesting route for me is the WSET courses. Um, what, what is that? For, that some, is, for somebody that knows nothing about that field. What, it's like the wine specialist route. So a certified specialist of wine. Oh, it sounds exactly like where you would want your skill set to go. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's more focused on wine. So the SOM, I mean, I have so much respect because when you watch the movies, and they did a great job with this, is they know service and they have to know liquor, they have to know cigars, they have to know all um, of it. Yeah. I mean, it is just this massive world and the geography and the history of where things come from. So I dive really deep into wine, and one of the third level of the WSET course is actually where you get into the blind tastings. And right now, that's where my skill set is. I have not taken the the courses and the study material to, you know, be able to talk about the history of the vineyards in France. And mm -hmm. I want to learn that. So I'm, I'm learning that as I drink something, I want to know about that vineyard mm -hmm. and where it came from. But when it comes to the flavors and knowing just about wine production in general, mm -hmm. that's the course that I would take. If I ever get the chance to do it, that's where I'd head. <laughs> I think you bring up a great point in the whole experience of drinking the wine and or eating or doing anything with food or wine, and I know we touched on this before, is story is king. Story is such a king, and, and even in doing something like this, the more you can acclimate yourself and know about where something came from, the more it's just like, man, it's just like it, it it'll start to taste better in your mouth, <laughs> like, like in your mouth, uh, yeah, in, face. in your in your face. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, the true story, I, I interviewed um, Resign Wine, and just like while we're doing the interview, they're they're telling me about all of their trials and tribulations of starting a wine business, and you're like, man, I really just like I'm all for this like story of them starting from scratch and then starting how did how did they get a bottle of wine on a counter space like where does that come from and when you start learning about where they came from it's like man this wine tastes so much better because it's like you can see the sweat and everything that was put into that bottle um and when i was talking to you earlier you were talking about how you actually went and you met with the person that made this one wine that you were pairing for this wine versus beer thing yes. and and i think that was the hand, like for that one that was the hands down like i think that one over over everything else during that whole um meal but it was just cool that you're like oh hey by the way just the other day i was talking to the guy that probably put this in this bottle uh, by the way, I, I love your presentation. Like you're so serious when you're doing your wine versus beers. You're like, here, I'm I'm here to I'm not here to play games. I'm I'm here to win. This Javi, wine I take beer. it very seriously, especially <laughs> because when I have someone that uh, like my husband who likes to just 
be very happy when he beats me. Mm-hmm. I have to step up my game, my competition side too, and be happy when I win too. Yeah. No, it's really it's it's fun for me because the stories are key. The stories are key because it's the when I have different challengers come in. So like. Kristen's story of why she knows about the beer world. Um, our For friend- those that haven't seen it, Kristen oh. was another person that was pairing the beer against her in one of these events. Yes, and then you know we have people that come in um, from our friend that works in the industry, and he has a whole story for each of the beers because we often use the beers that his brewery brews. So he knows not only like what it is, oh, but that's tough. You know, that's who, tough. he's like blood, sweat, and tears into this. <laughs> he beer. can like literally talk about well, janitor so and so was yeah. cleaning up this mess just to days ago what are you going to turn down that person okay he's been working on this beer yeah that's that's tough you really pull at the heartstrings <laughs> and i think that's important too and when i have wines that i remember it's not always the wine the wines are good i'm probably going to remember the wine because it tasted good that's that's the that's the baseline mm-hmm. but it's what's layered on top of that so you know i have a memory of sitting at i was sitting at Pebble Beach Golf Course. I'm sitting at this place called The Bench. It's like their bar restaurant area that looks out over the last hole. Mm -hmm. And you see like the Pacific Ocean and whatever. I had this beautiful glass and it was a minor family. They're in in California. Minor family Viognier. I like the Viognier. It's very good. But when I looked around and I looked where I was, I will never, ever forget that glass of wine because, you know, the sea is crashing and the air smells like, you know, California. And I'm you know, I'm sitting in this beautiful place. So the, the stories that you can connect people to are really important. And also, who produced it? Um, when somebody has a passion or, like, you had the opportunity to meet someone who started their own winery, mm-hmm. it's where did, why did they do it? Um, what are the struggles they've encountered along the way? What are their big successes so far? Like, it makes it really exciting and you feel connected to that wine, that brand going forward. Um, and that's what I, I always thought about this with the cork in the road. And yes, it's a little, it's a play on words, but I do, I do wine, whatever I'm, what I do wine in everything else I'm doing as well. Mm -hmm. Wine is always a part of my path. And it's like, it's like what I'm doing while life is also happening around me. So that's my, like, at some point I'll have to make a decision of my fork in the road. Will it be Mm -hmm. wine or will it be mm, everything else? But (laughs) right now it's what's happening. Wine is always going to be there. I'm always learning about it. Always interested and passionate while I'm doing all other things in life, wine can really weave in through the stories and the people that you meet and the connections and the classes I do. It's like, it's all part of my life, even if it's not the only path that I'm taking right now. So that's where that that's where that comes from. And it's all about the stories and the experiences. Yeah, I think I said this earlier to you, but I think you can't put a price on nostalgia. It's like, if, if you can hit that stroke of, the, like you were talking about in Pebble Beach, where you just know and you get the smell, you get the scenery, and everything just like, or uh, when we were talking about port, like it just reminds you of sitting by a fire, and then it just accentuates that experience. And if you haven't had port before, like legitly, it ta- it just tastes like you should be having it by a fire and just like- Wearing yeah, leather. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but nostalgia is so key, and that plays into the story. Um one more time, let's uh, just to give people the gist of the wine versus beer thing that you got that you do, and then we'll we'll cap it off. Um, it's it, at surface, like if you're at an airplane looking down at the event, what's happening is there's five courses, and then uh, Kelly will show up, business or not business as usual, man. She comes to play, uh, and what they do is they pair wines and beers for each course, and there's I'd say about 20 to 25 people there, right? Right. And it's a great experience, but the the overall statistics and things that you get from that, the data, can you explain why you do it from the data standpoint? That is so, that's the nerdy part. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, that's the nerdy part, but it is the most important to me mm-hmm. because it's I've, I haven't seen the information that I'm gathering readily available. So yep. I feel like I'm, I'm gathering something that can be really helpful to the industry. So the, the information comes from people selecting whether they liked the wine or the beer with each course, but they also rate the wines and the beers individually. So while, before they, taste, before the they taste the meal. So they're giving me a rating scale of one to five, you know, one being gross, um, five being I want to drink that every day. It's the best wine ever. And it's kind of their own personal choice. But it gives me an idea idea of the individual scores and then how it might have changed when they have the meal. So let's say you have a, you know, a five scored wine. This person is in love with this wine. But the pairing that I gave them with the food, they're like, mm, 
that didn't work. We're going to go with beer. That's really important information to me because then I look back. I add this all into my my database, my Excel spreadsheet mm-hmm. kingdom. And <laughs> I, um, I look at it and I see, okay, that flavor in that dish did not go well with that type of wine. So then I'm like, okay, I know that that didn't work. And it kind of gives that insight. But I also find it very important when I buy the wines from the retail space or, you know, we have someone that is at a restaurant and they're serving it that's on their menu – I gather this information and give them a full stat report after the event. Which is invaluable in terms of R&D. It's, it's crazy. It is. And they don't have the, they don't always get to ask the questions that I'm asking during the pairing events or actually get the feedback of like what worked, what didn't, yeah. and in competition with another beverage like beer. So, for example, you know. And guess who touches all of those points? Standing right in front of me, a cork in the road. Uh, continue. <laughs> Too kind. Um, so, I mean, I, I really like food and I like drinking. Hey. Um, so the the information allows you to give it. I give the report to the restaurants and I can say, or the retail shop where the wine came from. And I say, you know, this one really shook out. But I also saw that a lot of males liked this wine. I also collect male-female information. I collect if they're tea or coffee drinkers. Yeah, or if they like beer or wine. Regardless, what's their bias before they even show up? Yes, I have them. That's the initial. They get their sheet, and um, that's the format is they tell me that, and then I use that as, like, confounding variables at the end. You know, this wine won, but was there anything that may have impacted why that won? And I look back, and I say, oh, well, you know, wine won in this dish because all of the pre-decided, predetermined wine people liked that wine. But mm-hmm. then I'll also see, you know, maybe a beer won, and I'm like, okay, what happened? It converted eight of the wine drinkers to pick beer. That's I've really seen it. I've seen it happen personally. It happens actually mm-hmm. quite a bit, yeah. um, and that's the cool, exciting part. But that's the time if you didn't have the opportunity to drink both of the beverages at the same time. If you had them a week apart, you wouldn't know. Nope. But if you have them together, and it really allows you to say, in this moment, what am I tasting? What's different, and what do I like? And those experiences. I mean, you could do it at home. You could open multiple bottles and do it. But having it be like you know five different pairings, so 10 different beverages, five different flavor flavor courses in Mm -hmm. one night, it really lets you compare and contrast throughout. And then I collect all that information, crunch all the numbers, and then give reports back to, yeah, the retailers, the restaurants, or the guests when they come. Um, And my challengers, you know, who comes in and they get to see how their pairings did as well. Mm -hmm. It's And it's crazy because I'm biased towards beer. But what she was talking about, the I think it was the the was it from Argentina, the guy that you just met right before oh, the um. No, that was he's from Alsace, France. Uh, Alsace. Trimbach, okay. yes. So Mr. She brought, Trimbach. Yeah. So <laughs> so she brought this wine, had had the awesome story and everything to pair with it. Um, I tried. Uh, both the beer and the wine tasted amazing beforehand. Um, I think that was my favorite wine, just tasting it by itself. Uh, but the beer, I think she had the pog for that one or an, an, another one. Uh, but anyhow, it was a great beer. Uh, and I love beer. So, uh, was that with the pork? It was pork. Yeah, so this was the main course, and it was phenomenal pork. Shout out, Baines. Um, anyhow, after having it the, with the wine, it was like, holy cow. It just, like, it completely changes the timbre of what's going on in your mouth. And it's funny that you say that phrase a lot, talking about this kind of stuff. Side note. Uh, but... Also, when you have that, I was like, no, literally that and with the dessert course, when you when I had the wine, it was like, uh, it's it's not it's like kind of sugary or whatever. But then when it was paired with a sugary thing, it it was it was, the sugar wasn't there. It just complemented everything that was going on in the dish. Same with the pork one. It was like, holy cow, I could drink this like water. This is like I just want to eat the pork and drink the things. It was so good. <laughs> Go back and forth, back and forth, yeah, one, yeah. one. and one. One bite, one sip, one and, bite, uh, one sip. <laughs> yeah, and like I said, uh, I think that one won by a landslide uh, during that course, but it's it's so crazy that you can have something and just be like, Why, what? And then you have it with the meal and you're like, oh, that's the whole reason they did it was because of these things. And so I think the craziest one that you paired for was the um, your friend Liza was super into organic things, right? And she paired most of her decision to pair for that one, which the wine won on this one, was because her friend loves organic things. So she went for the most organic and what bio... It was, what was biodynamically it? farmed Verdejo. <laughs> yes, yep. That's yeah, why. Hashtag mm-hmm. green living. Um, I'm going to just keep throwing out those hashtags. I don't know if hashtagging things is dead, but you should definitely send your meals and ask 
a cork in the road, what you should pair your wine with to her on Instagram, on Twitter, all those things. But anyhow, uh, at a, a cork in the road, that's where you can find you, right? Yes, at uh, a cork in the road. So for these events, is there any information that you want to give to other people that say they're a retailer or whatever? Mm-hmm. How can they get in touch with you and what, what does that look like? That's awesome. Yeah, mm-hmm. I actually am looking to do more of these. Our friend group here, we love organizing them. I mean, I kind of, I set up the event. I do all of the coordinating of time and, and you know, making sure everybody's got their, their assignments of what they're doing. And I welcome new challengers and things like that. But we do it for our friends. And oftentimes we bring in new people that have heard about it. And it's becoming, you know, sometimes I have a wait list now and I feel really bad. So I'm looking for more venues to do it. Um, I've had some, I've done one at a restaurant that was really popular. And a restaurant can do it really easily. All they have to do is just reach out to me, direct message on Instagram, send me an email, a cork in the road at gmail.com. Send me an email. If you want me to do an event, it really needs to be a place that already can serve wine, beer, and food. Um, That's really important. I can do all of the hosting, give you my data collection, set it all up, um, and spread the word, promote it, and and run the event while I'm there. And so it's really just up to anyone who has kind of an interest in using my data collection format to learn more about their pairings. I often find that new restaurants really like this because they're Mm -hmm. trying new things, or a farm-based restaurant that is always changing up their menu seasonally and always has a kind of a limited beverage list. Those ones have reached out to me lately because that way you can kind of test what's doing well with the certain dishes that you're serving at the time. So you can switch up your wine list and also know that it's going with some of these popular pairings that shook out well during the events. So yeah, I'm, I welcome any restaurant distributor who wants to who has a venue where we can do this to reach out to me. I'd love to do more. What what a time to be alive! What a service! It's a, like it's crazy to me what that a like time you know, to but, be alive. but uh, like that that's such a thing. Like if I owned a restaurant, like I would want to know, especially for all the dishes that I have on the menu. That's, that's so crazy. All right, thank you so much. A cork in the road, Kelly. Thank you so much for being on the show, and I hope you guys reach out. Send her. You know what? If you're like making mac and cheese tonight, send her send her a photo of that. Uh, if you are, you know. I might. Well, I'm not. Gonna, I was gonna say baby food, but don't give don't give wine to your babies, <laughs> um, because I, you make a. I have a kid. You make a lot of baby food. Um, yeah, I hope it was a good experience, and I will see you guys on the next one. This has been Passion in Progress podcast with your boy Javier Mercedes. Thank you, Merce Nation. Till next Wednesday, I will see you guys later. I'm out. <laughs>